I have a fun fact for you. Back in 1936, the Queen Mary, one of history's most famous ships, was introduced as the biggest in the world with a displacement and a tonnage both around 80,000. But the Queen Mary II, the modern day equivalent, has a very similar displacement, around 80,000 tonnes, but it's almost twice as big at 149,215 gross tonnes. So although the two ships weigh essentially the same, Queen Mary II is much bigger. Now wait a minute, I hear you ask, what does all this actually mean? Well to get to the bottom of it, we need to know how to weigh a ship. Let me explain. In general day to day life, the concept of weighing something is pretty simple. We just whack something on the scales to see how much it weighs. But how on earth do you weigh something as large as a ship? You could set up some kind of scales in a dry dock, but the truth is even the smallest of boats are nearly much too big to fit on any sort of scales, and it's also the fact they spend most of their lives in the water. Just how could you weigh something that weighs nearly as much as a million people stacked on top of each other? Well thankfully some clever brains have figured it all out. Today we'll learn the difference between ship's weight, tonnage, and displacement. Then we'll see just how these massive vessels are actually weighed, and how their weight can be impacted by some surprising factors. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and this is how you weigh a ship. If you've watched a lot of this channel before, then you probably know all about Olympic and Titanic. But if you're new to all this, then I'm sure you've at least heard of the latter ship. Let me give you a quick rundown. These two sister ships were built by the same yard using the same materials, mostly steel, but Olympic came in at 45,324 gross registered tons, while Titanic measured in at over 46,000. Now this of course made Titanic the biggest ship in the world, but it may surprise you to learn that both ships were of essentially identical proportions and size, like length and width, and Titanic had very little added machinery that would tip her over the scales. This is because that little figure I mentioned, gross registered tons, is actually an archaic measure, not of weight, but of a ship's internal usable volume, all the combined usable space inside. Knowing the difference between all these confusing terms like net tonnage, gross tonnage, displacement, and so on, it's a really great way to start before we learn how to actually weigh a ship. So let's begin with probably the most simple metric, displacement. Displacement is commonly used in relation with the mass of a given ship, although surprisingly it's not actually a measurement of the ship's own weight, it's the amount of water mass that's displaced when a ship is floating freely on a body of water like the ocean. We know thanks to Archimedes that the amount of water displaced by a ship is equal to the mass of the actual ship itself. It's a raw basic measure of a ship's sheer size and mass, but it can be read a few different ways. First of all, there's light displacement. Light displacement is the mass of a ship that is completely empty. That means no cargo, the fuel tanks are empty, empty ballast tanks, no consumables like food, and totally void of any passengers and crew. Truly a completely empty vessel, just a big mass of steel. Now of course, a ship is rarely, if ever, in this state, but it gives naval architects a good basis upon which to gauge the performance and the stability of the hull during design. This is usually calculated during the design stage, based upon measures of the hull volume and the actual materials being used, and then it's checked when the ship is finished. Next, there's load displacement. This is a measurement of the ship's total mass while it's floating in salt water up to her summer load line. The water itself is another variable here. Different seasons and conditions can actually impact the salinity, the saltiness of the water, and the properties that the ship finds itself in. It sounds crazy, but put simply, some water is actually just harder to float in. It's why ships have this mark, the plimsoll mark, painted on their sides with different letters for all the different conditions the ship is reasonably expected to encounter. Tropical freshwater provides, in essence, the least buoyancy, the least amount of floatability for a ship, and it will sit lower in the water, while winter in the North Atlantic will see the ship riding higher because of the salty, dense seawater. The plimsoll mark is an easy way of making sure from the outside that the ship isn't overloaded for the conditions it's expected to encounter. For example, the summer load line is an indicator of the ship's maximum depth to which she could be filled safely with cargo and passengers and fuel during the summer months. So with a ship full of passengers and the normal stuff you'd expect a ship to be carrying, load displacement gives you a good read on what a ship would essentially weigh during many of its day-to-day -day operations. 
Today, big carriers use DWCC, or deadweight cargo capacity, as a measure of just how much cargo a ship can reasonably carry in all different weather conditions. In summer, when the ocean water is denser, ships can actually carry more cargo before they hit their load line, purely because the water is more floating. Finally, there's present displacement. Now this is the sum of the light displacement and everything that's currently on board at a specific moment in time and not in the hypothetical. So simply put, it's the mass of a ship at a very specific time in its voyage. It includes cargo, fuel, crew, supplies, and passengers, just like load displacement, but this can fluctuate because food is eaten, fuel is burned, and passengers get on and off. So the same cruise ship on day one of its trip will displace way less on day five of the holiday when all of its passengers have got off and all the food and fuel have been burned up. Ships are constantly fluctuating in their sheer mass thanks to the fact they're so big and they support so much life on board. Displacement gives a good, rough indicator of how big a ship is. Historically speaking, it was important for charters and treaties like the Washington Naval Treaty, which sought to limit the size and number of warships being built around the world. It meant no cruisers bigger than 10,000 tons displacement could be built, but in the end a few signatories ignored this and started building bigger ships anyway. They knew they were well outside those restrictions, but of course they happily reported their ships to be well under the limit. That's a story for another day. So going back to the original example, Olympic and Titanic, both ships had a very similar load displacement. They were made out of the same stuff, they were the same size, and after all they carried a very similar amount of people. But Titanic's gross registered tonnage was bigger by about a thousand tons. Now this is where it can get understandably confusing because tons are usually a measure of weight, right? You know, like imperial or metric tons. But the tons in this context are not that at all. They actually refer, well, originally at least, to barrels of wine. This sounds crazy, but bear with me. Measuring tonnage has a long and interesting history, well, I think it is at least. In the most general of terms, tonnage is a measurement of a ship's size. It can be expressed in terms of weight, but usually in terms of volume. The term has been around for hundreds of years, but it's not always represented the same value. The general consensus from historians is that the word originated from the word tun, spelt T-U-N, which was a medieval term for a cask of wine. So the earliest method of measuring ships, their size, was to simply count the number of casks or tons of wine which could be stuffed into the holds of a vessel. That number would be listed as the ship's internal carrying capacity, and it gave a pretty useful measurement of its actual usable, practical size. When ships were charged dues, like tax, imports, and things like that, it would then be based on this measurement. See, you can make a ship out of insanely heavy material. It'll displace 100,000 tons because it weighs so much, but in theory it could be so small inside that only a tiny portion of it can actually be used for anything. And its tonnage, and that is the usable interior volume, could be something silly like 100 tons. Tonnage gives a more accurate picture of just how much internal space can actually be used and how big the ship truly is. Back in the 15th and 16th centuries, when tonnage was kind of being standardised, ships, like all things, were regulated by their governments, and under the first recorded act in dealing with ship measurements, back in 1492, King Henry V decreed that kills that carry coals at Newcastle should be measured and marked. Now, it's not clear from this decree just how those measurements were to be conducted, but what we do know is that right around this time there was a big change. Instead of measuring by volume, ships were being assessed by the weight of the cargo they carried, so a tonne, valued at 2,240 pounds, or 1,016 kilograms, became a standard unit of measurement. As shipping became more prominent and governments wanted to make sure ships were paying their proper dues, there were a number of attempts to create a measurement standard to ensure consistent values. One of the earliest examples is known as the Builder's Old Measurement. Now this was adopted in Britain by an Act of Parliament back in 1773, but it had actually been in use more informally as early as 1650. With this system, a ship's tonnage was based on the length of the vessel and its maximum width, and it was expressed as tons burden. Builder's old measurement would remain the standard for decades and decades, right up into the 19th century, when with the advent of steamships, the standard for measuring had to be reassessed. See, sailing ships at the time were essentially just big open hulls with masts on top. There were no watertight compartments or ballast tanks or internal machinery. Their cavernous interiors were just jammed full of grain or sheepskins or whatever was being sailed out. That all changed with the advent of the steamship. These new age vessels were built completely differently. They had a larger ratio of length to beam, significant portions of the ship needed to be dedicated to boilers, machinery, coal and engines, and then there were all the safety features like double bottoms 
and watertight compartments. This was all space that couldn't be used for cargo. George Mawson of the British Board of Trade devised a new method of determining a more accurate measurement of a ship's size. So a more accurate size measurement would also mean a more accurate indication of the ship's actual earning potential, and then fees could be determined more appropriately. The Mawson system would feature two outputs, gross registered tonnage and net registered tonnage. Gross registered tonnage, expressed as GRT, was a measurement of the total internal capacity of a ship. Now this includes the underdeck volume, the volume of the tween spaces on deck, the superstructure, the deck houses, and so on. But it's important to note that the measurement didn't include the safety features like the double bottom, the navigational spaces like stairways, or the ship's kitchens or galleys, and light and air spaces like trunking. It was just a measure of the total actual usable space aboard the ship. The sum of the volume measurement was then divided by 100 to get the ship's calculated gross registered tonnage. So Titanic, even though she displaced around 52,310 tonnes, had a gross registered tonnage of 46,329 gross registered tonnes. Now this gave her owners and operators a good indicator of just how big the ship actually was, and it's the figure that was used by trade journals and newspapers to compare her against other ships of the time in the contest for size supremacy. But it was a little misleading. Titanic's hull was absolutely full of massive machinery that consumed a huge amount of that impressive volume. Now that's where, internally at least, another figure was important to show just how much of the ship could really be used by the company to generate some profit. Net registered tonnage, or NRT, was a measurement of the capacity available on board for cargo and for passengers, so it didn't include accommodations for the crew, any of the safety features, none of the storage spaces, the water ballast tanks or space for machinery, like the ship's engines or propeller shafts. So whereas gross registered tonnage was a measurement of a ship's total volume, the net registered tonnage was a measurement of a ship space that could really be used to generate profit, whether it be for cargo, more passenger cabins or public rooms. Titanic's net registered tonnage, once you took out all that crew space and machinery, was reduced to just 21,831 net registered tons. So, now, with that out of the way, we can answer our question, just how and why was Titanic bigger than Olympic if they both weighed kind of almost the same? Well, put simply, Titanic's designers closed off spaces that on Olympic at least were open promenades and deck space that didn't really factor into the ship's registered tonnage. The owners, the White Star Line, converted these spaces, including the entire B-deck promenade, or almost all of it, into usable, profit-generating spaces aboard Titanic. The changes added about 300 tonnes to Titanic's overall weight, her displacement, so all that extra bulkhead installation, panelling, furniture and the like, but a lot of cabins were put in for first class that added to Titanic's net registered tonnage, so it increased Titanic's NRT as well as her GRT by about a thousand tonnes over that of her sister. So even though Titanic and Olympic had almost identical dimensions, Titanic just had more usable space inside, and so therefore she could boast about, technically, being the largest ship in the world. The Mawson system was accepted and put into use in 1849, and it became law under the Merchant Shipping Act of 1854 in Britain. It would remain in place until the International Convention on Tonnage Measurement of Ships came into place in 1969. This convention, with such a catchy name, was adopted by the International Maritime Organization, the IMO, that year. It was meant to introduce a universally recognized tonnage measurement system See, before then, a few different systems were still being used at the same time. Of course, they all derived from the Mawson system, but there were still considerable differences between them, enough so that it was collectively realised that a new international system had to be put in place. Gross registered tonnage and net registered tonnage became gross tonnage and net tonnage, respectively, although their purpose was obviously similar. Gross tonnage stayed a measure of the overall size of a ship and its internal volume, and net tonnage is still a measurement of the useful capacity of a ship. It's just been standardised on the world stage. Today, both gross tonnage and net tonnage can be used to calculate port dues and fees. But one final measurement to note is that used in the maritime industry, dead weight. A ship's reported dead weight tonnage is crucial because it represents the overall carrying capacity of the ship measured in tonnes. For ship owners, this information is critical because it determines their vessel's profitability as well as playing a key role in determining some of the ship's fees and port dues. So for example, massive oil tankers like the Seawise Giant. This ship is the biggest tanker ever built, around half a kilometre long, 
that's over 1,500 feet, and displacing around 82,000 tons empty. But fill her up with oil and it's a different story. The ship could displace an unimaginable 646,000 tons at full load, meaning that once you subtracted that 82,000 tons of actual ship and steel, she was carrying around 564,000 tons of oil. So her deadweight tonnage comes in at 564,000 tons. It's very impressive stuff. So why is knowing the weight of a ship, or at least having a standardized method of recording the weight, so important? Well, as a matter of physics, of course, it's crucial because the stability and the buoyancy have to be adhered to so that a ship can not only just remain upright in water, but minimize listing back and forth and pitching, or even the risk of just straight up sinking. Physics aside, governments, organizations, and ship owners haven't devoted hundreds of years to perfectly weighing a ship just for safety and the physical aspect. The measurement of a ship ties directly to its operational capabilities and its profitability. Tonnage directly impacts how much a ship can carry and basically just how much money it can earn. It's all important for big businesses to know just how much profit they stand to make or lose. A ship's measured weight also correlates with a few different safety regulations. For example, gross tonnage dictates requirements for safety equipment, the number of crew, and the training level they have to go through to be certified on their role for that specific ship. So for example, satellite emergency positioning beacons, or EPIRBs, and search and rescue transponders, or SARTs, are required for all passenger and cargo ships measuring in excess of 300 gross tons on international voyages. Crew size regulations are set by the IMO as well, and they're determined by gross tonnage, since bigger ships just need a bigger number of highly trained crew. So, now the all-important question, how do you actually weigh a ship? How do they know how much a ship displaces once it's all loaded up? Well, the easiest way is to observe the draft marks. These can be usually found at the bow, they're often at the stern, and they're sometimes amidships on both sides of the hull. These markings are painted directly onto the hull when the ship is built, and they're maintained as a matter of great importance, because like the plimsoll marking and the load line, the draft marks can be used to calculate just how much weight the ship is carrying, if a ship's sitting deeper in the water, then the water will rise to meet one of the higher draft marks. Now, this is a read of how much water the ship's displacing at that exact moment. When it's multiplied by water density, which can today be read with instruments on board, it essentially gives a general figure of the ship's weight. This is the way it's been done for hundreds of years. In essence, to weigh a ship, you first need to know a few things about it. How it was built, the hull volume, the builder's figures around its light displacement, and then how the ship is sitting in the water. All of this will tell you its weight. Ships have got a lot bigger and a lot heavier over the last few hundred years. The Great Eastern, a behemoth of her time in the 1800s, came in at 18,915 gross registered tons and displaced over 32,000 tons. She was heavier and had even more internal hull volume than the impressive later liners like Kaiser Wilhelm der Große, which launched nearly 40 years later and was the first proper four-stacker ocean liner. In the 50s and 60s, different materials began to be used in ship construction that helped reduce their weight without impacting the internal volume of the ship. So aluminium, or aluminum to our American friends, was used in excess aboard ships, up top in the superstructure where the deck houses and passenger spaces weren't expected to come into frequent contact with the ocean. And this helped save a heap of weight, but it also had some serious drawbacks, probably most dramatically demonstrated when the Italian liner Michelangelo copped a monster wave over the bow, which caved the lightweight superstructure in, killing three and injuring more than 50. Today, big ships like the Queen Mary II are built using almost entirely steel, but thanks to welding construction over riveted construction, the ship's actual weight can be kept way down. Factor in that ships now use space-saving diesel engines, and they don't have to have a third of their hull space dedicated to massive boilers and steam turbines, and you end up with a bigger ship that weighs less but has more inside space. So that's why Queen Mary from 1936 weighs about the same as the Queen Mary 2 today, but Queen Mary 2 has almost double the internal space that passengers and crew can actually use. And that is how you weigh a ship. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.